Thanks very much, Roland. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, title of my presentation this afternoon is a, is a warning you're probably all familiar with. Some of you may even have encountered on your way here today. Uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, what I want to try and do is provide you with some insights and thoughts from our perspective at, at, at Orbis into both the risks and the challenges uh, and opportunities, I should say, in investment markets. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to provide you some helpful pointers on your journey, either your financial journey, either towards or through retirement, uh, and, and in the process, illustrate why I think that phrase is pertinent uh, in today's investment markets. Um, as Laura and Dan said, out really, when we think about uh, getting ready for uh, uh, retirement in a financial sense, uh, we basically have two levers to control. And uh, we can control how much we spend over time um, and uh, where we are invested. I'm not going to spend too much time on the first of those levers. Um, suffice to say that the less you spend, the longer your pot will last. That point's been well made. Um, I think where Orbis may be able to help is in terms of where you are invested. But there is an important uh, point to note here in that these two levers are, are clearly linked. If you can get by with withdraw withdrawing less from your pension pot, as Laura and Dan pointed out, you can afford to have a more conservative uh, investment profile uh, and vice versa. So I thought I'd try and share some ideas in terms of where you might want to be invested today um, by, by inverting the problem. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd really try and answer three questions for you. And first is to say, look, what are the common pitfalls with investing? Because investing is one of, has one advantage in that, yes, it can be very complicated, uh, but it doesn't need to be. If you can avoid some of the really big mistakes out there, the nice thing is you can actually do better by average just by doing that. You don't have to be a genius to do well at investing. Um, so I thought I'd cover them and then try and look at ways they can be avoided. Um, and then finally, how Orbis might be able to help along that journey. So what are the common pitfalls? There are a few. What I've done today is I've picked three, and I've chosen them by, by ones that I think are probably particularly pertinent in, uh, in today's environment. Um, and the first one I came up with was the idea of confusing stability with safety. This one, I think, probably makes us all feel a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, I want to put two lenses onto this pitfall. The first lens is to think about inflation. If you put your money in cash, it feels very safe. It's very stable. It's very hard to lose money if you're invested in cash. You have to be extremely unlucky if that's the case. Um, but it's not safe from an investment perspective because inflation is eroding the purchasing power of your investments. So when you think about inflation, it's important also to recognize time horizons matter an awful lot. We've become used in the last few years to an environment of very low inflation. This chart shows the long-term history of inflation. The last 10 years have averaged about 2.4%. Um, most people in the room, when their, their retirement uh, planning horizons can be considerably more than 10 years. The 30-year average inflation rate uh, is somewhere near 4%. I'm not saying inflation is going to go back to 4%. I'm just saying that inflation presents us all with a risk. You know, we have to recognize that we need to grow the purchasing power of our money once inflation is taken into account. Uh, and that's why it's important to have some real, uh, real investment exposure. The second lens I want to put on the idea of, of, of stability and safety being confused is a more topical one. It's a more challenging one as well, so bear with me. Um, and, and I think it goes back to the previous speaker. I'm afraid our industry does a terrible job at making investment more complicated than it needs to be. And one of the ways we manage to do that as an industry is by, is by this whole talk about risk. If you ask people in the investment industry what risk is, you might get one of these equations or one of these definitions. Most of the time, people will come back and say risk is equal to volatility. In other words, risk is, is, is somehow linked to how much share prices or asset prices move in the short term. And that's all very well. It's very convenient for people in the industry, by the way, because it means they've got a nice number they can put in the spreadsheet. Um, but when you, when you speak to real people on the street and you ask them, what, what's risk when you're, when you're investing? What's risk with your money? The real people I speak to, say, you know, they think about risk in terms of losing money. Uh, or, or probably more accurately, it's the risk of not having sufficient money to be able to fund their spending needs. Um, and I think, I think this presents a, a bit of a challenge, because we all know if people start losing money or not having enough, that's how they feel. Um, how does this play out? Well, typically, if people are scared, they're worried about not having enough money, they say, OK, what is a safe investment to have? And the default proposition is to say, well, rather than just holding equities, hold some bonds. Um, and uh, today, as you all know, the yields on bonds 
have come down a lot. And so that has morphed slightly in terms of saying, well, you need a return. You need some income. So rather than holding bonds, um, why not hold some safe equity or some stable equities and just essentially hold them for the dividend yields? And I want just to drill into this and kind of why, um, uh, why this might be challenging at the moment. Uh, some of you who are here last year may remember this chart. Uh, this shows the long-term history of government bond yields. So what you can get by just investing in the JP Morgan Global Government Bond Index. I thought it was low uh, a year ago at 1.5%. It's now down to 1%. So I'm glad it wasn't a forecast back then. Um, but what's often missed with these low yields, which we all know uh, uh, present a lot of challenges for investors, what's often missed is that the price sensitivity of bonds has gone up. Um, price sensitivity is measured by something called duration. Again, don't worry about the term. It's very simple. Duration is measured in years. It's on the left-hand axis. Today, the duration of global government bonds is 8.5. And what that means in, in, in plain English is that if government bond yields go up by 1%, by just 1%, the price or the value of the global government bond index will go down by 8.5%. So eight and a half years of interest payments could be wiped, up, wiped out by a 1% move upwards in global government bond yields. Really important to say I'm not forecasting that. It may or may not happen. I just don't know. I claim, to, I, you know, I claim no knowledge as to what's going to happen to government bond yields. But if you're getting paid 1% per annum and you're running the risk that a 1% upward increase in yields wipes out eight and a half years, to us that's just the very definition of, of poor risk and return. And as any of you have been reading the financial press, the problem is actually even a bit worse than this because that's the average global government bond out there. <laughs> Underneath those averages are what are negative <laughs> yielding bonds. And this is as nuts as it sounds. There are bonds out there which if you buy them at today's prices, you will get back less in money than you're paying for those bonds. That is as nuts as it sounds. And it's not a small problem either. Today, sorry, today there's literally $15 trillion of negative yielding bonds out there. If you own any global government bond index or a tracker fund tracking uh, global government bonds, chances are at least some of your portfolio um, you will be invested in bonds which are going to return you less than you're paying for them or than they're valued for today. It is crazy and it's a real challenge because the so-called safe portion of people's portfolios typically has essentially become so richly priced that it's locking in a guaranteed negative return. The previous slide was designed to say it has turned the investment world upside down. I'm not going to go back one, but uh, it really has done. Um, and that's why I just, I just wanted to highlight that confusion of stability uh, with safety. Government bonds have been very sta stable, but anything that guarantees you a negative return, it, to me, is not a safe investment. Um, so that's the first uh, pitfall. The second one, and it's kind of linked to this. All of these are linked. Um, the second pitfall I would just highlight is to chase what's done well recently. Unfortunately, we all find this very easy, very tempting. It's down to human nature. As a species, we have evolved to know that it's safer to stick with the herd or with the pack. Um, in investment terms, that's actually disastrous. Because if you hold what everyone else likes to hold, that optimism of everyone is going to be reflected in the price of those investments. Um, and, uh, this, uh, and, and essentially the way that's manifesting itself today is that with bond yields so low, people who would typically have held bonds have said, well, what is the next best alternative? What can I hold that looks and behaves a bit like a bond that means I don't have to hold these negative rates? And typically what people have done is to look for companies, large companies that are stable and pay a stable dividend. Um, and you can see this has been going on for five years, but it's really accelerated in the last 18 months or so. The dark blue line here shows an index of low volatility companies. So these are the types of companies I've been talking about. Classic example would be Nestle, Coca-Cola, Unilever. You know, all good companies, great brands. They paid stable dividends over long periods of time. They're not, and they're never going to grow particularly quickly, but they played a solid and steady yield. <laughs> The shares in those companies have performed extremely well, nearly 15% as a basket over the last two years. If you contrast that with the value index, so a, company, uh, a group of companies that optically look quite cheap, you know, they've, uh, the, the performance gap is nearly 15 
or 20%. What that says to me is that valuations haven't really been driving the market re recently. It's the quest for yield that has been driving the markets. Unfortunately, to our eyes as contrarian investors, what this means is that there's probably a lot of risk of losing, or potentially a lot of risk of losing money in this group. Um, but the good news is that there's potentially opportunity down here. It has created what, we, what we're referring to as a hidden bear market. Uh, why is it a hidden bear market? Well, if you look at the market indices out there today, um, they're all in sort of positive territory over two, three, five years. So it's not, there's no obvious bear market. It's a hidden bear market because these uh, low volatility companies, typically the mega caps, so they've been driving the returns of the overall indices. So if you drill into what's been driving the indices, it's a very um, a sort of bifurcated, apologies for the pretentious term, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a separated uh, performance of stocks. Big cap companies paying these stable dividends have done very well in terms of price terms, but everything else has pretty much been, been left behind. You can see that just by looking at this chart, which shows in the dark blue line the largest 50 companies. So no, no style screen at all. I just literally picked the biggest 50 companies. Since the early 2018, they've returned nearly 5%. The red line shows a portfolio that just took every stock globally around the world and equally weighted it. So this would include all of the small and mid-cap companies. Again, you see there's a huge difference in performance here. And to our eyes, that smells opportunity as potential risk up here, risk of loss, I should say. So those are two pitfalls um, that, uh, that uh, I thought I'd flag. The third one is uh, a, per a bit of a perennial. And apologies for the graphic. I'm not quite sure what's going on in that picture. The graphics department went a bit mad. Um, but uh, this is a bit of a perennial. What, what do I mean by having a home bias? And why is it important? Well, again, it comes back to human nature. We all feel more comfortable with the things that are familiar to us. And investing terms, it's very tempting to see that familiarity in UK-listed companies. And why does that matter? Well, back in 1900, it maybe didn't matter too much. Back then, it was very expensive or risky to invest outside of the UK. And the UK made up 25% of global stock markets. So you had quite a bit of choice back then. If you fast forward to today, I don't know what people would guess at this number, but the UK makes up just 6% of global stock markets. So if you are limiting your portfolio to that 6%, very hard to believe you're giving yourself exposure to the really best investment opportunities out there in the world. Just to complete that bar chart for, for today, interesting to note that the USA makes up 53% of the world index at the moment. Um, the rest of the world kind of makes up this. And I think on a really long-term perspective, the way we see it is that you know, that's probably a good source of opportunity uh, if you consider the scale of the economies in the rest of the world um, and the opportunities out there. So three uh, potential pitfalls. How can they be avoided? Well, I thought I'd tackle these in reverse order. Uh, firstly, how do you avoid having a home bias? Firstly, just be aware of it. Uh, I have to say, I use AJ Bell for my SIP, and there is a great portfolio radar in there. You can use it, and it kind of use some wizardry to see where your exposure is. There is no right or wrong answer to what your exposure is. Just be very careful if it is 100%. Um, also allows me, talking about the home bias, is to mention these two characters, which I'm sure you're all delighted to see pictures of right now. Um, home bias, it's very tempting to focus on this sort of issue when it comes to setting your investment strategy. If there's a, if there's a sort of ancillary message I would leave you with is you know, don't let macro or political decisions drive your investment strategy. These are, and I haven't even mentioned the B word, but um, these are emotive topics. And we all know when emotions get involved, people tend not to take very good decisions. Um, and just on a practical note, it's incredibly difficult to know what's going to happen politically or ec uh, economically. And even if you did, which you don't, by the way, but even if you did know what was going to happen, uh, you wouldn't know how the market is going to react because it's incredibly difficult to know what expectations are bedded in. So leave politics to one side, focus on the good habits like investing regularly, keeping disciplined, uh, and not over-trading. Apologies, AJ Bell, but I know you agree with me on that. <laughs> Um, so how do you avoid chasing what is, uh, what's done well recently? Uh, again, firstly, being aware of it. Um, 
uh, is probably the key trick. The way we focus on doing it is, is, is to avoid looking at asset classes on a top-down basis. Um, we're very skeptical about things that have gone up a lot, and we tend to find the opportunities uh, are easiest to find in underloved and under-researched, neglected portions of the market. Um, we call it, when we go invested, we like to say it's like fishing with a hook, not a trawler. Uh, if you think about the US today, it's gone up an awful lot recently. Margins are stretched, multiples are stretched. If we look at the market as a whole, we think it probably looks rather expensive uh, and it, it, consistent with other forecasters, we see probably negative returns on a five to 10 year view from the US market as a whole. The good news is that you don't have to buy the US market as a whole. Um, it is of course made up of uh, lots of individual companies. And while when we look at many of them, they do look individually overpriced, it does mean that there are a, a portion that, that remain attractive and attractively looking, looking to us. Um, so there are opportunities, um, even in areas of the market that have done quite well. Uh, the final pitfall um, uh, about confusing stability with safety. Um, I think the, the, the best bit of advice I can share with you around this is to never ever lose sight of valuations. No investment is safe if you pay too much for it in the first place. So if you see popularity, enthusiasm about an asset class, a fund, a company, whatever it is, uh, gets so extreme, everyone's talking about it, and people have stopped talking about the valuations, the underlying valuation metrics, that's probably a warning sign. Um, the way we look at the markets today is to think about the distribution of returns within a market. So if you think about a stock market overall, it might be expected to have a distribution of returns like this. On average, you would expect it to be slightly positive, some years you're going to have a negative return, other years you're going to have uh, a quite a positive return. If you think about the stock market as a whole, you can separate the companies within it into the companies that are, uh, that are highly predictable, kind of that have low volatility, and companies that are unpredictable and have uh, 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 high volatility. And you can separate them out, and in a normal market, the two groups of stocks would look a bit like this. The high certainty stocks, would be clustered around a relatively narrow range. By definition, they're much more predictable. Uh, and, uh, but they would be lower, they would expect on average to have a lower return than the stock market. The low certainty stocks, by definition, in the dark blue line, would have a much broader range of outcomes. In a nutshell, as a result of the uh, downward movement in rates and everyone in the bond market looking to buy stable investments, we think that um, the markets today look a bit like this. The high certainty stocks have been, uh, uh, have been bought to such an extent that on average, many of them look to us to be uh, downright expensive on, on the long-term view, five or 10-year view. That doesn't mean they won't continue to go up over the next year or two, um, but on the long-term perspective, we are nervous about them. Um, and we think that there are much better opportunities in sections of the market where, that have some degree of uncertainty. A classic example of this would be the premium auto manufacturers. Everyone today is, think, is, is, is thinking that there are a whole range of things that are going to disrupt the sector. And you can buy premium automakers like BMW and Honda at valuation multiples that are same as they were in the great financial crisis of 2008, 2009, when literally there was a reasonable concern that the world was going to come to an end. Um, so people are really pricing in an absolute worst case scenario in certain industries because of some questions. The nice thing about that is that things don't have to go perfectly for those companies. They just not have to get any worse. So how can Orbis help? Well, in a nutshell, uh, we offer two strategies that you can invest in through the AJ Bell platform. They are best suited for the portions of the, your, your portfolio that you've set aside to provide inflation protection. They're not income generating funds. They're designed to offer total returns. Um, our investment philosophy is summarized as fundamental, long-term, and contrarian. We spend all of our time turning over stones in the market, looking for the relatively small number of stocks uh, that might be mispriced. Uh, as with the, large, uh, the last speaker, we have a long-term perspective. We're not interested in what's happening next quarter or next year. Our aim is to empower our clients by enhancing their net wealth over the long term. Above all, from an investment perspective, it's this point. We believe that the best investment opportunities are found in neglected areas of the market. That's all easier said than done. Um, so we've spent a lot of time building the firm in a way that supports this. We have a, an ownership structure which will keep us uh, privately owned in perpetuity. 
that means that no matter how tough our investment philosophy gets to implement, we can always put our investment considerations ahead of our own commercial considerations. Um, we have individual accountability, uh, which means that we have a team of approach, uh, a team-based approach. We have no star manager uh, risk. Um, and above all else, we've aligned our interests with those of our clients. I'll talk about what that means in practice in, in, in 30 seconds. But in a nutshell, we can only do well as a business if we do well for you as clients. Um, complicated sli uh, slide, very simple message. You can see it in the pack that gets circulated. Really, it's just two details of the two strategies. O Orbis Global is a purely equity uh, strategy, uh, and the balance fund is a mixed asset, a multi-asset um, uh, strategy. How have they done? The global equity strategy has uh, 30 years of history. Uh, it's meaningfully outperformed over that time frame. But critical to note, within that long-term history of adding value, there have been meaningful periods, you know, five years at least, where we've underperformed the benchmark. That, to us, is an inevitable part of the process. We're highly active managers. Uh, we're going through one of those periods at the moment. Uh, but it is the price to pay for superior long-term returns. We are positioned today very much out of consensus. Um, but therein lies opportunity, in our view. This is a fund that's designed for people with a five-year time horizon, a, a, at least. The global balance strategy is designed either for people with a shorter-term strategy, uh, a shorter-term horizon, say three years, or for people who would rather give up a bit of return in exchange for a smoother ride. So the benchmark for this strategy is global equities and 40% uh, global government bonds. The returns generated so far have been despite essentially owning uh, nothing in global government bonds because of our views on, on the risk return potential there. Um, I've been asked to say very briefly what we do differently. Um, we uh, have a unique selling proposition in that we charge zero management fee. We have zero ongoing charges. We only charge a fee as a manager if we outperform the relative benchmark. So if all we do is, is perform in line with the benchmark, we'll be cheaper even than a tracker fund. Those performance fees uh, are, not, uh, uh, are not just paid when we outperform. If we subsequently underperform, they re they're refunded back to you. The aim being, in this day and age, is that we want to make sure that our interests are aligned with yours and that our fees have the best possible chance of representing good value for money. If we're underperforming, we don't charge. Um, and finally, just to say, we're going through one of the periods of underperformance. As a result, uh, from where we stand at the moment, both existing and new investors have the opportunity to invest. We're below our high watermark, um, so the next uh, uh, meaningful chunk of outperformance will actually be uh, um, uh, achieved without us charging any fees. So just to wrap it all back up to where I started, mind the gap, I think we live in extraordinary times. What's happened in the global government bond market has had a clear spillover effect into the equity market. Portions of that market have, been, uh, have done extremely well because of the characteristics, the bond-like characteristics of some of those shares. To our view, to our perspective, many of those companies look expensive and there's real risk in owning them because the risk of losing money long term uh, is very real. The flip side of that is that we think there is uh, a good opportunity if you're willing to stand aside from the crowd and look in some of the unloved areas of the market. Um, that's how we're investing, and, and I hope if it's of interest, you'll either drop by and um, see us on the stall afterwards or check out the website at orbis.com. Thanks very much. Thank you.